something's not quite right here. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. Today we're going to check out the shop called Wellstrung Guitars. It looks like they've revamped their website since the last time we checked in with them, and a lot of their guitars actually have prices now, which is great if you're not necessarily serious about buying and you're just curious, you know, how much does a custom color jazz master cost from a premium vintage shop? But out of hundreds of guitars, here's like 20 of them that spoke to me. Starting with the one that sparked this episode, look at this weird SG. Looking at it side by side of a normal one, you might notice, oh, your headstock. It looks a little bit thinner. We've got the crown inlay of a SG standard, but we've got the same style tuners. The fretboards are looking about the same. We've got dual P90 pickups with wrap tails, but take a close look at the body. You see this right here, the contour of the SG, which gives it its iconic horns. This one does not have that. So according to this shop, they believe it to be a 1960 Gibson prototype as they were starting to design the SG body shape, perhaps to stay within the line of slab body juniors and specials. When they first came up with this double cutaway design, they had a slab body here before they ended up carving it. What's kind of shocking to me is how remarkably clean this thing is, especially for 1960. They rated it a 10. Unfortunately, this one doesn't have a public price tag, but it is pretty cool. Next up, we have one from 1964. So this is an ES330. Normally they would have P90 pickups, but this one came stock from the factory with humbuckers. That's why I like the shop. They have all the coolest vintage oddball models and custom colors. This thing is beautiful. 1960 345 Argentine gray. Look familiar to something that we just documented? Yeah, it's the BB King model. This one also has the mother of pearl inserts, gold hardware and all that stuff going on. I still have one of those for sale if anybody's interested in working a deal. I wanted to click on this one because that seems like a really reasonable price tag. $5,000 for a 78 custom? And I use that term relatively because when you're in a shop that has 100k plus guitars, seeing one for 5,000 isn't as shocking, I guess. So what makes this one kind of interesting is the fact that we still have a three-piece top, but one piece has a little bit of flame figuring within it, so it kind of makes it cool. Doesn't look like we have any custom color or weird attributes on this one. I guess it's within the maple neck era, that's why the finish looks a little bit different on the neck as compared to the dark mahogany body. Tuners and everything are looking good here. A little bit of wear to our headstock. And wow, you don't see that very often. You've got a a lot of lacquer shrinking going on up here. That's a chunky one, a little over 10 and a half pounds. But this next one is insanely cool. So it's a non-reverse Firebird 3 in custom frost blue. This thing's from 1966. The fact you could get a guitar in this color is just kind of mind-blowing in my opinion, especially with the matching headstock. And I generally don't like the non-reverse Firebirds that much. But this is the one that has the three P90 pickups. And from this photo, it looks nearly immaculate. They have a condition rating of 9.5. I'd assume the 0.5 is your tuners have been replaced and you've got some edge wear, but that's to be expected on a giant Firebird. But take a look at this $50,000 Firebird. So it's from 1965, and I love our description here. Firebird 3, Lefty Headstock Cardinal Red. So you might question that whole lefty headstock thing. Why don't they just call it a reverse headstock? Because this body style of Firebird, the first one, the most traditional one, is known as the reverse. So if they would have called it a reverse headstock, they would technically be referring to the original headstock design. So you can't call that a reverse. So calling it lefty is probably the best way to not cause confusion. But other than that, you just got a cool custom color with matching headstock. That is the opposite of what it normally is. I'm not sure which headstock style I like best though. I like weird goofy things, but personally I think this is one time where I prefer tradition over strange. But now let's move on to this $40,000 Firebird, where I kind of like the goofiness of it. So it's Inverness Green, which is insanely cool, but it's also one of the 12-string versions. Now typically, these 12-string Firebirds, they sell for less than the regular ones, or at least that's the way it is within the 335 world, because most people don't want the 12-strings. So sometimes players will take them and only string them up halfway, and they just have this ridiculously long headstock for no reason. But you've got some nice yellowing to our lacquer. Lots of finish checking. That's going to have a vibe in person. Kind of cool figuring to that Mother of Pearl logo. The 335s had the same one. And it's such a cool alien green finish. And the fact that it's from the 60s, again, mind-blowing. But if you want tradition and custom color, and you have $105,000 burning a hole in your pocket, here is a carry green. According to them, it's one of the rarest custom colors of the Firebird. And I've got to say, yeah. That is a bragging rights piece. And just imagine, you can actually go to their store and see this stuff. <laughs> they don't charge you admission. And I'd hazard a guess that they don't have everything listed online too. But this video is not sponsored by them. They just have cool enough stuff that we need to talk about them. 
Next, another one from the late 60s. It's a Barney Kessel model. I've seen a lot of these in burst colors, but walnut stood out to me. Looks like we got some nice maple figuring within it. It just kind of looks like a double Florentine cut ES-335 because this is the finish that you would see on so many of those instruments at that time. And of course, you got some hang tags and old strings. So that was a pretty cool find. But this is another one that falls in the category of I can't believe this existed in the 60s. So this one still has hang tags and this clean, that's almost unbelievable. This looks just like some of the Alex Lifeson reissues, but it's from 1967. It's been that immaculately kept. I mean, white finishes, they go yellow. But this was straight from the original owner and apparently a custom order. The original owner requested a slim neck depth and nut and he did not want a clear coat to avoid the yellowing over time. I'm not really a paint guy, so I'm not sure what not having a clear coat might do to your guitar, but it seems to have held up okay, and we've got these old photos, which is always nice to see. But check this out, Les Paul Jr., natural finish, pre-TV yellow, they say. So there's a lot of theories behind the whole TV finish and why it was out there, but perhaps this early new finish example will add more leverage to the claims that they were just trying to make it look like a Telecaster. I mean, from far away, it looks like the TV yellow that we all know and love now, which I'm sure most people would just be like, who cares? Why would I want that? But if you've got the collector mentality, oh man, it even says TV model on it. But unless you're a collector, you probably don't care about that and don't want to have to pay an extra 30 grand. And this one I wanted to check out because I'm selling something similar. So here's a 1962 Gibson Les Paul before the name change. It's the ebony block version, which is the coolest. We documented one of these last year. It's got some cherry color, but it's definitely faded in the arm area. The cool thing about this one is the story. So they bought it from the original owner and he recalled a time of not getting along with the trim system. So he sent it back to the factory for intonation inspection. And then they just sent it back to him with a letter that said, hey, this is working as we intended it to. <laughs> so yeah, those things were not that good even from brand new, but you get that letter and it's got the original case. Kind of gives it a one up and on the one I'm selling. It's also got the original teaspoon style arm, but this one's priced at 33,000. And I was shocked to see an Epiphone Coronet at 10,000. Kind of curious what's going on here. It's probably just because of its clean condition. Cause yeah, that one does not look too bad. And you might think it's crazy that collectors will pay twice as much for a guitar just because it's clean, but it gets really crazy the cleaner and cleaner you get. But you gotta love the bat wing headstock. Next, we've got a really cool Fender Telecaster in Fire Mist Gold Metallic. I don't think I've ever seen one of these before, but then again, I'm not really actively searching for custom color 60s Fenders. But the fact that we still have the ashtray cover over the bridge and it's a cool custom color telly makes it worth talking about. Looks like we got a ding right here so we can see through to the alder body. But all things considered, also pretty clean. But check out this $140,000 base six in pink champagne sparkle. Like <laughs> that's just insane. Back of the body also has the finish, but the back of the neck is left alone. Looks like it got played quite a bit. Even with the matching headstock, that would be fun to document. And apparently Fender, back in the day when they would do things like this, they would send it off to an auto body shop to do it. Here's a Fender Telecaster from 1969 with matching headstock called Candy Apple Red. Now it looks like it's faded a little bit, but that doesn't take away from how cool it is. And check out the 73 Telecaster in a lavender lilac finish and ashtray cover. Also in incredibly good condition. This 53 Telecaster looks like it got bedazzled a little bit, which gives it character. That's funny, they used the same terminology I did. But now we've got a couple of favorites that we've talked about in the past. So this is one of the coolest tenor guitars I've seen. Rumble Seat Music sold this one to them a couple of years ago. And this is one I would like to add to my collection. And I'm glad it has a public price now, 15,000. I was kind of hoping it'd be like 8,000 though. <laughs> That's probably what I would ask too, because it's just so weird. It's an SG standard body, but in tenor configuration, so it's only four strings. Oh, not even to mention the Bigsby. And we've got a non-reverse Firebird headstock, which just looks incredibly good since we've got the inlaid Gibson Mother of Pearl logo. Most modern players don't have a big use for a tenor guitar, but maybe they're making a comeback. Just look at those silly tenor tellies we documented that went insane in value. And even better, we've got a letter from the original owner telling about how it happened. Fender didn't respond and Gibson said, if you'll pay for it, we'll do it. Wow, that's crazy. If you think tenor guitars are strange enough, now there's three quarter size vintage ones. And now this time we've got a double cutaway Les Paul that's a banjo, but electrified. <laughs> so it's kind of within the tenor family. So strange with the chopped off other side of the body, but it goes to show you what Gibson would build you if you're willing to pay the money. But look at that, it even has a stinger. What a bizarre guitar. 
Here's another one from our last episode. I was curious what they would price the sparkling burgundy Les Paul Custom at. And the answer to that question is $18,000. So typically, like a really clean early 70s Les Paul Custom, they've been fetching around that six dollars to $10,000 range. So even taking kind of a midway point, call it $8,000 for a really nice example, then doubling that price point, that's how they got to $18,000. Honestly, I don't think they're that far off for a cool custom color custom. The neck still is very <laughs> strange to me. Me on that one though, how it has this whole color fade going on. It is possible, but sunlight would have had to have been just hitting that area to bleach out all the red. I guess the photo I would want to see is underneath the tuners. Is it still ultra red underneath there? I'm sure they've checked themselves. Otherwise, if you just want something similar to this, find a wine red 74. You'll save yourself a lot of money. And then that green burst 68 got a price tag. I'm kind of shocked at that one at 26,000, but I can see why they wouldn't want to sell it because that's pretty cool. A vintage green burst. There weren't many green guitars at that point in time. And I dig that all green neck. And this one wasn't too bad. The 330 with no F holes, 11,000. It's quirky enough. I could see somebody paying that and a custom color Inverness green to end our episode. Yeah, there's one more, but I don't want to talk about it because I need to save up some money and buy it from them. <laughs> All right, troglodytes, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day, and you might even enjoy this next one. Thank you.